All right, welcome back to another episode of the Paycast. So today with me on the line, I have Dave Randorf, who is a play-by-play announcer for Sportsnet. I would like to thank him for taking time out of his busy life to come on the Paycast. So uh, let's start off with how are you doing? I'm doing very well, Michael, and uh, glad to be on with you. And uh, yeah, my busy life, listen, I don't think anybody can right now say that they're super busy. But uh, nonetheless, it's a pleasure to be on with you today, buddy. Thank you. Uh, so let's get right into it. Why did you want to go into sports journalism? I didn't, actually. When I was uh, your age and when I was in uh, senior in high school, I knew I wanted to get in broadcasting, but I wanted to get into radio. I loved the radio. I loved listening to the radio, whether it was talk radio or music radio. But my initial goal and direction and dream was to be a DJ, like on a rock radio station. I grew up in Vancouver, and there was a station there called Seafox, still is to this day, and they play the rock, and we listen to it all the time in the car, and, and I wanted to be on the Fox. That's what I wanted to do. So that was my initial uh, direction to get in, to go to broadcasting school, out of high school, and uh, I got into that, and I went to Ryerson in, in Toronto. I moved to Toronto at a young age, and uh, got into radio and television arts, and then it was only then that I got exposed and uh, to the you know all the different areas that are out there in broadcasting, and that's when I started honing in on uh, being a sportscaster. But my initial plan was <laughs> was not to get into sports at all. I knew sports and I loved sports, but I wanted to be into I wanted to be a rock and roll DJ. That's what I initially wanted to do. So you did say that you moved from Vancouver to Toronto. How so that was a pretty big move in your life then? It was. I was. Uh, I was 18 years old when I moved here, and uh, I had fa- I had a lot of family here, so that helped me out. Uh, but I was I moved at a time this was mid 80s, and in high school in Ontario they still had grade 13. They mm-hmm. didn't have grade 13 where I came from, so everybody was a year older than me when I and, and and even more so when I came here. And that may not seem like a lot, but when you're 18 and everybody else is 19 and they're of drinking age, it just seemed like they were a lot older than me. So it was kind of a big move. And I was going to a school right downtown Toronto, and and it was exciting, but it was a little intimidating at first. But I was very lucky to latch on to some good friends that I still have to this day. And I also was very fortunate to uh, uh, get a job very early on uh, in my first year at uh, TSN. I mm-hmm. got a job. I got a job in the newsroom there. Uh, TSN had been on the air one year. Like oh really? Like, when you yeah, joined? Yeah, yeah, this was September of 1985. And uh, TSN had just started way before you were born, Michael. They <laughs> yeah, of course. They, they started in September of 84. So think about that. They were the only, it was a crazy idea back then that they're going to start this 24 hour news channel. Everybody thought, oh, that'll never last. You know, <laughs> who's going to watch sports all that much? So obviously we know the answer to that. So I got a job in the newsroom and I had basically zero experience. So it was at a time when they were hiring young guys like me. Hmm. Obviously, I was going to a program that that uh, they knew of, and, and they were hiring young people out of it. But I would never get the same job today with that that amount of experience. So I was lucky to get a job, get my foot in the door, and to make some friends. And uh, and that's when I started honing in on being a sportscaster. So did you uh, start TSN like right out of uh, university? Uh, you mean uh, on the air? Yeah, yeah. No, I uh, I, I actually worked. I was a three-year course at Ryerson, and uh, again, it was called Radio Intelligent Arts. So I had my job in the newsroom and be all behind the scenes all through all through my three years at Ryerson. There was one summer I took off. I got a student reporting position in London, Ontario, at a local channel there called CFPL, which I believe is still there. And they had a local news hour, and they hired students uh, on an annual basis, and I was lucky enough to get one of those positions. So that was my first real on-air kind of experience. I didn't do anything on air at TSN. I was all behind the scenes, but I was lucky enough because the the network was young enough that, again, they were throwing inexperienced guys like me into these positions that they never would now. You you know, now the same position that I'm talking about that that I got hired for, you have had to have graduated from Ryerson and probably had a couple of years, and the lineup is like a mile long. So I was kind of lucky uh, just from some timing, but Um, I took advantage of it, and I slowly but surely wanted to get into the on-air end of things, and so I didn't do any on-air at TSN. I wasn't ready for that. Uh, In fact, I was given some advice by a a boss 
who then was my boss, who said, you know what, I don't know if, because I did a screen test, I did an audition tape. And he said, I don't know if this is for you. You should maybe really, maybe start uh, uh, looking somewhere else and then and trying to apply your strengths in another area. And I was disappointed at the time, but I kept driving, pushing forward and, uh, and got a, a job locally back in Vancouver. So I left Toronto, went back to Vancouver, and that's where I started my on-air career. And then TSN eventually, uh, a few years later, hired me back. So uh, where did you find the motivation since you didn't get the job at first? It's kind of an interesting story there. Um, when I said that they, they did an audition with some guys internally because it was so young, they were looking to promote some guys from within, and they needed some, some reporters in the Toronto area that they could uh, add to their stable of people. So they gave three guys an opportunity to go out and do a report and to also sit on the set of what was then called Sports Desk. Now it's called Sports yeah, Desk. Right? Yeah. Now it's called Sports Desk. And we all did the same thing. So two guys got to move on and they got to do on-air work. I was told, this isn't for you, try something else. The other two guys, one was named Mark Bunting, who was on TSN, was a reporter for a long time, and now he's uh, I still, I believe he's still on the Business News Network. And the other one was Rod Smith, who to this day is still on TSN and is one of their uh, one of their main anchors and has been for years and hosts the uh, CFL on TSN and all that. And uh, uh, we're still good friends and, and all that. So those two guys got to move on. I had to go <laughs> to the, uh, go look elsewhere. So where did I get the motivation? You know what? Um, there's a saying that you you can't learn unless you fail. And yeah, that's I consider, true. I don't consider this a failure, but I do consider this an obstacle. And it motivated me. And at the time, you know, I was very young. And at the time, I was more than a little frustrated and hurt and thought these other guys were getting the chance. And, and I wasn't. And I was being told that this wasn't for me. And so I used that as a little motivation after I settled down a little bit. Because when you're young, you hope and expect everything's going to happen right away. Mm -hmm. But uh, it didn't, and it was probably the, it was in fact the best thing that could have happened to me because I put out resumes and audition tapes from all the way from Victoria, BC, all the way across the country to Halifax and all points in between. There was a lot more local stations in between the major markets at that time, uh, and I was able to hit them all and and try to get a job somewhere. And I was lucky enough to get hired back in my original hometown of Vancouver to do uh, local sports there, which I did for six years. So I uh, just, uh, it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I wasn't making all my young mistakes on a big stage like, like TSN, even though yeah. TSN was still young at that point, it was still a national network. Well, yeah, for sure. Cause it's in a big uh, area like Toronto where all the national media is broadcasted out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so so, oh, so sorry, you're right. Ahead. I mean, you, you need to go, you need to, there's, there's very few, people out there that can start right you know at the top and this was mm -hmm. essentially the top even though tsn was still as i say a young network it was a national uh, it could be seen coast to coast and if you're making your mistakes in front of that many people coast to coast it kind of sticks with you and you have to yeah. really work to overcome that first impression so i made all my mistakes in front of a smaller audience uh in vancouver well they always say you have to uh, work small to get big that's one thing, but at the same time, I wouldn't discourage anybody for dreaming big and shooting high. Oh, yeah, uh, for sure. You, you have to be true to yourself. You have to be honest with yourself and, and recognize what you are actually ready for and what you should maybe take a step back and, and work up towards. It's like, like a hockey player. It's like a kid getting drafted. They all want to be in the NHL squad right away. They all, all want to play in the NHL right away. But, you know, you might need another year in junior. You might need a couple of years in the American Hockey League. And nobody likes it at the time, but I think most guys would look back and say, that was probably the best thing for me. Yeah, yeah. Some players uh, would definitely be able to say that. Um, while you were working at TSN, I did some research and uh, your role expanded, meaning that there was more pressure. How did you uh, deal with that pressure that came with that? Hmm. I don't, I don't want to look at, look at pressure, but uh, there is a certain amount of expectation when mm -hmm. your role is expanded. Uh, when I was hired back, I did the local sports in Vancouver on a local nightly sports show that doesn't exist anymore, but it was great at the time. Uh, and then they hired me back at TSN. And I was a reporter at first out of Vancouver, so I filed reports for Sports Desk and then Sports Center. And then a few years later, they opened a studio up there. And I was a co-host of Sports Center. I think it was still Sports Desk at the time. I co-hosted it from Vancouver with Darren Detition 
and a guy named Mike Toth, who was on the show at the time. He was in, one of them was in Toronto. I was in Vancouver, and we kind of co-hosted the late show. And uh, there, I'm sure there's some people out there who maybe remember that. And I did that for years. And then that led to other assignments. I got to do some studio hosting on bigger events, like uh, we went to the Olympics in Sydney in 2000. And I slowly but surely got some assignments to uh, to call some games, some smaller hockey games. And, and I actually called a couple of CFL games, too. Uh, so that was, they really broadened my horizons and gave me opportunities. And there was pressure there, but uh, I also... Uh, try to overcome that with preparation. Just prepare. Uh, rehearse, study, read, ask questions, be respectful, be on time, be organized. All those things that you need as a broadcaster, that's what I utilized. And, and listen, it wasn't perfect at the beginning. I, I still don't think you have a perfect show every night, even after all these years. But but uh, I showed enough that I was able to keep going and, and keep getting the opportunity. So it wasn't so much the pressure as it was the preparation that helped me overcome that. Well, that's good. Um, in June of 2014, uh, you ended your TSN uh, run and decided to join Sportsnet. How did that change affect your personal life and your job life? Well, um, personal life, uh, not a ton. And that, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I probably travel a lot more than I, than I did. I used to travel a lot while I was at TSN, but not as much as I do during the hockey season now. Uh, so uh, I'm away from the boys a little bit more. I've got three sons and my family and friends, you know, all, are, all understand that they don't see much of me during the hockey season. But uh, I try to still fit in some some uh, private life stuff and personalized things. But professionally, it was it was a it was a huge change. Um, TSN, uh, I had a long, uh, great run at TSN. I, I worked with great people. I worked for great people. And they literally took me around the world quite Figuratively and literally, I traveled right around the world, went to countries and cities, big and small, for great events that I never would have gotten to otherwise, and I'm, I'm, I'll be forever grateful for that. But uh, uh, when you get a call, when Sportsnet and Rogers bought the national rights for the NHL, and to have an opportunity to work for what is still, in my mind, the biggest sports show in the history of Canadian sports television, that is Hockey Night in Canada, um, that was it was a privilege to just get the call to to see uh, if i'd be interested in it and uh, and then to you know actually be hired to be part of hockey night in canada and the nhl on sportsnet is uh, it's an honor and it's a lot of fun and i uh, don't take one single night for granted well that's good um how busy is your life during the nhl season i just want to touch on that uh during the nhl season it's it's busy yeah now, i don't want i don't want to make it sound like it's a lot of manual labor because a lot of people would uh, die to have the job that I have, and I get that, and I, I do agree with all of that. Yeah. So, and that's why I don't take any of it for granted. But, but I'll, I'll give you the, the quick uh, sketch of what my week would look like. It's sure. It's, it's it's busier than people think. Our national nights are Wednesday, Saturday, of course, and Sunday. Uh, mm -hmm. We have Wednesday night hockey. We've got hockey night in Canada, and then we have Rogers hometown hockey on Sundays. So I don't work all those nights but i often will work to sometimes all three of those nights in a week for for every week i work at least saturday and our boss is very good at, at spacing out our games so you're not i'm not working uh more than three games a week and on too many consecutive weeks because that would really kill you so let's say i'm working wednesday wednesday saturday i would travel on a tuesday to wherever city i'm going you get there on tuesday you do the game wednesday you fly home thursday then uh, I've uh, got to watch a game or two on Thursday night. You get back up Friday morning. I'm back on a plane to fly to Vancouver or Edmonton or Calgary to do Hockey Night in Canada. And then I may fly directly on Sunday to another city to do another game. Or on Sunday I'll fly home. I'll have dinner with the family and friends and everybody here and, and catch up with everybody. And then uh, back out on a, on a Tuesday again and it all starts over again. And in between all that, you have to read articles. You have to watch games. And I know that sounds like, oh, poor Dave, but uh, you have to keep that maintenance up. I don't take any nights off. I watch a game or two pretty much every night. Uh, and I record a lot of games so you can PVR through them to keep uh, current as to what's going on in the NHL. And then, uh, and then you have to read articles every single day and make your phone calls and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it's, uh, it's a busy, busy week. It's a fun week, and it's, it's a labor of love, and we all have a passion for it. And uh, but it's it's a little busier than people think. It's not just 
you know, if I only do two games a week, it's there's a lot more to it than just uh, working on those two nights. Yeah, that does sound like a busy life for you then. It's a busy life, but it's a great life. I, I, yeah, I, I would assume so. Fortunate. Yeah, I feel very fortunate. And you meet so many great people in on our team, on our crew. You get a chance to work with all these guys. They all are oh, men and women who are pros at uh, in the truck and at the rink and the camera people and and uh, the guys who sit with me at the booth and all of that. There's there's so many talented people on our team that you get to travel with and they become especially in the playoffs when you're on the road for like two or three weeks at a time. They're kind of like your extended family. And yeah. you go out for dinner. You go out for dinners with them. You go out after the game. You have a, a beer in the lobby bar or something like that and talk about the game that was and and uh, so it's 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 a busy life but it is a great life and it's a it's a privilege. So how early do you have to get to the arena uh, before games? On a game day? Yeah. Well, the game day kind of goes like this. It's uh, most games are 7 or 7.30. So most times both teams will have what's called a morning skate Mm -hmm. at the rink, uh, depending on if somebody played the night before. So if somebody played the night before, they often don't have a morning skate. So let's just say both teams didn't play. On, uh, on Tuesday, and they're both going to play Wednesday night. We go to the rink. Uh, one team will skate at 10.30. The other team will skate at 11.30. And a morning skate is probably more a habit than anything for NHL players. It's a chance for them to get out to the rink, put the gear on, loosen up, get out of their beds, get out of their hotel rooms, just kind of get the legs moving for and get ready mentally and physically for the game that night. Uh, most morning skates don't last more than half an hour at most. There's not a lot of technical stuff done. Uh, there's some drills. There's some some hard skating, but uh, it's just to get on the ice, feel a pump, yeah. get the legs moving, get the blood pumping, build up a sweat. And for us, it's a chance to make sure everybody's out there, that uh, nobody's hurt that we didn't know about, and uh, we can watch in different line combinations. Are sometimes tested out in the morning. We can go, oh, well, that guy's now playing with him tonight. That's interesting. We'll ask the coach and the players about that later. They come off the ice. We go into the room, we talk to certain players that are made available. Uh, sometimes they're all available, they're all sitting around in the room. Yeah. Other times you have to ask the team to, for permission to speak to this guy or that guy, which you do. Then you have a chat with the coach for about 10, 15 minutes to find out what he thinks about what happened in the last game, what he thinks about this opponent, different line combinations and different things that he might be willing to share with you, depending on your relationship with that coach. And most guys are pretty good. And then you do the same thing for the other team, the visiting team. After that's all done, I go back to the hotel. Uh, I take all the information that I've compiled from that day and work it into my notes, tune up my notes and my rosters uh, for guys that may not be playing that night, take them out, put other guys in, and just uh, update everything. I print all the rosters and notes. Uh, I might squeeze in a quick workout. And then I'm at the rink two hours before the game starts. Uh, okay, that's go, not bad. Yeah, I usually go straight to the uh, the booth, get everything set up, and then uh, before you know it, you're on the headset, you're talking to the guys in the truck, you're going through elements uh, like different tapes or different stats packages that may show up on the show that may or may not. Okay. We go through all, we go through a lot of story ideas that some probably eighty to ninety percent never ever make it to the air because the story doesn't dictate that it. it you know, warrants us mentioning it. But you're always prepared for different scenarios in the game that we've all, ideas that we've all tossed around. And then before you know it, they're singing O Canada and dropping the puck. And then the game goes by like that. The game goes by generally pretty quick. And after that, you, you head home and uh, it's, it's 9.30 or 10, uh, back to the hotel. And uh, we usually convene down in the lobby bar as a crew and four, five, six of us and talk about the night. And maybe there's a late game on the screen. And you go to bed, you get up, and on to the next town. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. It isn't. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Isn't Sounds it? like a fun uh, journey. It is. And, uh, you know, you, 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 you get to all these different cities, but you get a little routine and you stay at the same hotel, so it becomes a little home, homes away from home. You kind of know the layout mm-hmm. of the land. Uh, you called a lot of playoff games uh, throughout the years, notably Connor McDavid's goal against uh, San Jose. That was his first uh, career playoff goal. And uh, even John Tavares' wraparound goal against Luongo in the 2016 playoffs. Mm-hmm. What's the atmosphere like in the arena when you're on the headset calling the games? There's nothing like the Stanley Cup playoffs. Absolutely nothing like it. It's the best time of the year for everybody involved. 
for the coaches and the players and the teams themselves, for the fans, certainly, and uh, mm-hmm. for sure for the broadcasters. There's not one broadcaster, whether you're an announcer or a producer or a director or a cameraman, everybody involved. There's nothing like the atmosphere, especially in the first round. Oh, yeah, because there's games every day. There's games every day. There's upsets always in the first mm, round. Yeah. But just the energy in the building uh, for those games when the team comes out, when they announce, the, the, the and, and now here's your, you know, your Toronto Maple yeah. Leafs, and they come charging out of the tunnel. And it's definitely a different level than it is in the middle of February. In fact, it's nothing, not even close. So you can't help but, as a broadcaster, feel and feed off of that emotion and atmosphere in the rink. So when you get to big moments like the ones you talked about, you know, as the play-by-play guy, you just hope that uh, you saw it clearly and that you had a good, clean call and you didn't make any mistakes and you didn't oversell it and didn't undersell it, didn't say too much, you didn't say too little, that you just gave it a nice little mm. accentuated punch for the viewer at home to uh, to convey the excitement of the moment and the drama of the moment and the uh, the magnitude of the moment, if it's a, a big one like that. Tavares' goal uh, when he was with the Islanders, they had not won a playoff series in over 20 years. Yeah, it, it was a I long was time. That. Yeah, it was a long time, and and that game was decided in double overtime. So you could cut the tension with a knife in there. Mm-hmm. It was very, it was everybody was super excited, but they were all really tense because these Islanders, long, long time Islanders fans who'd seen their team move to Brooklyn, which yeah. really isn't isn't close to where they used to play. Uh, they were desperate for this team to finally win a playoff round again. And they did. And that particular moment is probably one of my favorite moments that I've been around for. It was it was unbelievable. So that would lead into my next question. Uh, with the Florida and the Tampa game six in the 16 playoffs, would that be your favorite game then? You mean the uh, Islanders? And, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, the Islanders and the Panthers, sorry. Um, it's up there. Uh, I've got a lot of, you know, great moments of uh, of different, you know, moments in the playoffs. And, and I also had the good fortune to uh, to work at a lot of World Hockey Championships as well. Oh, when yeah. I was, mm-hmm. yeah. When I was at TSN. And, and so being there in, in Europe for a game that Canada's in the gold medal game, it, that's exciting as well. Because we're oh, yeah, games. for sure. So those those moments have been pretty cool as well. But. I will say that that uh, you know that Islander game was pretty cool, and, and you know I've told this story before, but I may as well share it with you. That particular um, goal call was was kind of a funny story. The commentary play-by-play position in that rink is called the Barclays Center, and it's in Brooklyn, New York, and it's it's a basketball arena. It wasn't mm-hmm. designed for hockey at all. There is no press box. Every uh, NHL arena has a press box that hangs way up high in the Raptors and looks down yeah. on the ice. That doesn't exist in the in the rink in the Barclays Center. You are literally sitting in the crowd. They they kill some seats, they take them out, they put some tables in there, and you're sitting, you know, in amongst the fans. So uh, the game goes into overtime, and most broadcasters, when you're in a moment like that, they say that, uh, oh, I didn't think of what I was going to say, and sometimes that's the case. Sometimes you don't want to plan too much, but most often guys will think, okay, well, if this does happen, especially with the Islanders. Uh, having not won in over 20 years, you want to come up with maybe some something good to say. So you yeah. prepare yourself for that moment. So it goes into overtime, and I don't have that line. I can't think of anything. Then it goes into double overtime. I still haven't, because I'm busy and I'm calling the game, I still don't really know exactly what to say. <laughs> but there's another intermission. So we're in, going into double overtime. I have to go to the I have to go to the washroom because I'm drinking water all night long. And I oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Go to the bedroom. So I make my way up through the crowd. And again, I, I've already told you that people are nervous and the tension and everybody is is walking around the concourse and they've all got their old classic classic Islanders jerseys on with the old names in the back, like Brian Trotche and Mike Bossy and Dennis Podvan. And they, they're just, these are old school Islanders fans. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. So I'm the only guy with a suit on. I go into the men's room and I'm standing up there along the, the wall with all the urdles there. And there's this one guy who is enormous like he is three times the size of me he's, <laughs> he's beside me and he looks down at me and he says in his new york accent he says hey buddy pretty good game eh?" and i said yeah he goes i tell you right now if the Bears scores tonight it is going to be freaking bedlam in here and i looked at him and i looked away and i said that's the line yep. <laughs> so I went back to the uh to my commentary position i wrote down bedlam in brooklyn and that's the line that i uh, used when 
of all people, John Deveris scored that, yeah. that goal. And it was pretty exciting because uh, there was a there was a real moody kind of build up to that moment. There have been some chances and oh, they yeah. were that was only game six. So that would have they would have not lost there. But the thinking was if they go back to Florida for game seven. All the Islanders thought, if we don't do it here, it, they're going to lose, and we're going to have to wait another 20 years. Well, anything so, can happen in a game seven. So, yeah, they right. have the right to, you know, yeah. doubt their own team. Now, and listen, Florida had some good guys there. Roberto yeah. Longo and Net, so, uh, you know, and, and they, they were well coached. And so, yeah, you're right. And, and they, they wanted no part of that game seven back in Florida, but uh, they didn't have to worry about that. So that's what happened that night. But it's it's definitely a good memory. It was what – and actually – what was exciting for me on that uh, particular occasion was that I did three, uh, three games and three nights um, in that particular. Oh, platform. really? Yeah, I did. Uh, I did a game in Chicago. Then I flew and did this game six in New York. Then I flew right back to St. Louis to do a game seven between the Blues and the Blackhawks. So it was a really exciting time for me personally. It was chaotic and crazy, but it was exciting. Because it's the playoffs, it just makes it that much better. You just you're just going on adrenaline. So you know you know the players by then. You just gotta just sit down and call a game and and try to get mm-hmm. sleep fast in between the two games and get those flights in. And then, uh, but uh, that was uh, that was pretty exciting for me. So what could you say would be the best thing about broadcasting? Hmm, the best thing. Well, yeah. There's, there's lots to it. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the people that you meet, the people you work with, and the people you get to be around. You get to be around these, these world-class class players, world-class coaches, too. It's a real privilege talking to coaches, in my mind. These guys are they're leaders of men. They're smart guys. They're always very interesting and have a lot of thoughts and great opinions that you can really learn from. So there's that, but I, I've got to say it's, it's, it's the teamwork that comes together with your crew, your producer, your director, your play-by-play guy, your color guy, the camera people. When you have one of those shows and it's a big game and you feel like you've hit all the high notes and that you hope that the viewer, that you gave the viewer an exciting night to watch. The yeah. Game. The players are obviously the show. The players are the show and they're the ones that, that put on the show. But we're the ones that communicate it. We're the ones that bring it into your living room on a Saturday night. And mm-hmm. listen, I grew up watching Hockey Night in Canada, just like you did. And, and you have friends do the same thing. It's, it's a, tradi- a tradition in this country. And it's a real honor and privilege to be part of that tradition. And you feel an obligation night after night to be at your very best, to make sure that uh, uh, people turn off the game going, well, that was a good game. I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I, not that I not that I really enjoyed Dave's call or really enjoyed that replay segment or I really enjoyed Louis DeBrusque or Gary Galley or, or Craig Simpson or Jim Houston. No, that's not it. I really enjoyed the game. Mm-hmm. If I hear the next day, uh, sometimes, you know, when I'm walking through the airport the next day after doing a game and some guys don't recognize me, I got my hat on or whatever, I'm just going about my business and some guys will say, hey, did you see the game last night? Wow, that was unbelievable. That to me is a huge compliment. When they don't even know I'm there, yeah. And you know that there was somebody at home and they were probably gathered around with their friends and family, having a beer, having a dinner together, going, wow, that game last night, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. That's when I know we did our good uh, good job. And that's the biggest kick that I get out of doing what I do. That's good. Um, and final question uh, would be, like, do you have any uh, advice for an aspiring journalist or a broadcaster? Yeah, well. You, sir, you're a young man who is, uh, seems pretty organized, already getting into social media and doing podcasts and things like that. So I think you are already ahead of the curve and you know, contacting people and bringing them onto your show. So I wish you the best of luck. But you and other people like you, I think, uh, I think what you have to do is you have to work on a couple of fundamentals. First of all, you have to be a good communicator. Mm-hmm. You have to be organized. You have to be informed. Uh, and you also have to have uh, ambition. Uh, everything, every walk of life right now, it's competitive out there. It and, is, yeah. Uh, even from when I started to where I am now, the amount of guys, listen, the lineup of guys waiting for me to get hit by a bus, <laughs> it's all <laughs> <long-term. laughs> And I know that, and that's that's all good, but it's it's you have to you have to shoot high, but you also have to be patient and and work at it, and uh, and take some <laughs> some steps to to get there. You can't just jump right in. You have to uh, you have to take some steps to get there, but 
don't be afraid to, to shoot high and don't be afraid to have some setbacks along the way. And then when you get there, you know, it's often said by NHL players, they say the easy part is getting to the NHL. The hard part is staying there. Yeah. And I thought at the time, well, that's that, really, honestly, you know, isn't the hard part getting there? And they say, no, listen, there's this guys, there's lots of great players out there and I was blessed. I'm a good hockey player, but staying there is the hard part. So mm. once you get to where a position like perhaps, you know, like mine, I don't know anybody. In fact, there is nobody in my position that doesn't work at this every single day and put the work in all the time, watching the games, reading the articles, looking back at their games to try to improve, always trying to get better. Um, so once you get there, you've got to work at staying there as well. So don't take anything for granted because things can change. Well, thank you for coming on today's podcast. I would like to thank, again, Dave Randor for, for coming on. You're very welcome. Best of luck to you, Michael. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good day.